welcome to session four, Sea Power and the Fourth Industrial Revolution, talking science, technology and industry. And I'd like to introduce the panel. We have Rear Admiral Wendy Malcolm, our Head of Maritime Services. We have Mr Joe North, Chief Executive Lockheed Martin. Next to him is Professor Tanya Monroe, who's our Chief Defence Scientist. And Mr Len Leonard Van Bockhoven, who's Global Lead for National Security in NATO, IBM Digital Twins. Welcome to the panel. I'd like to now invite Admiral Malcolm up for an introduction. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tish, and welcome everybody today. Uh, I hope you're enjoying Pacific 2019. Uh, fantastic opportunity today with some really varied and interesting speakers. Um, our format today is really to give each speaker an opportunity to talk about the topic and to really look at some of, some of the examples you're going to hear today are about defence, some are about industry and some are about the connection in both. We're going to try and keep those presentations reasonably brief so that we can make the most of the time to interact with the audience and get the most out of our great speakers today. So without further ado, um, I'll ask Tish to introduce the uh, speakers and uh, then we'll get going. Thanks very much. Thanks, ma'am. And just a reminder for the Q&A session at the end, um, just use your app or the Twitter. And I've just been asked to let you know, when you go into the app, make sure you actually link into the interactive session and ask your questions through that. If you ask your questions through that front page, they are not being received. So you just need to link into the interactive session. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr Joe North. As mentioned, he's the Chief Executive Lockheed Martin. Thanks, Mr North. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Uh, today I'm going to discuss and show you some examples, both small and, and a little larger, of what the Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, provides for sea power technology. Australia's defense capability in its industry are evolving pretty rapidly, and the former Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Barrett, kind of characterized it as this. Australia is currently undertaking the most ambitious recapitalization of its naval fleet since the Second World War, and building a national enterprise for shipbuilding and sustainment. The fourth industrial revolution provides great technical opportunities for Australia's sea power, utilizing combinations of people, computational systems, networking, manufacturing technology, and industry expertise. Sea power is complex, but at its heart are the people and their abilities. With the use of advancing technology, the human's abilities can be enhanced. The Industrial Revolution is vital for Navy and industry, and I'll provide those examples and applications both in maritime and some in aerospace, and then what that technology does to make uh, available more capability, efficiency, and including cost savings in the process. If we look at the people side, an ex example I will give, I was the Lockheed Martin program manager for the Toro combat ship uh, in the US. Uh, very rapid development and production opportunity, and it also allowed us to adopt new practices and technologies to enhance sea power. The Navy specifications for those ships required a crew size of 75, where previous ships of that size and complexity were manned at 210. What we did to highlight our, our technology was industry utilized an integration, integrated automation capability, and we also monitored the performance of all the major ship systems which supported obtaining a goal of the smaller crew, also reduced maintenance hours in the process and sustainment cost. The use of enhanced automation and integrated controls reduced the operational bridge manning to only three, vice the traditional dozen. The automation capability was used to support redefined crew roles, which were then further enabled due to onshore-based training systems wherein the operators could train to certify before arriving on the ship, allowing them to be more effective much faster. There were no sailors required in the machinery spaces on these ships during operations due to the automation, the reliability, the prognostics, and the remote monitoring. Sailors developed new skills to utilize the greater levels of automation and the integrated data analytics, which resulted in an expanded situational awareness. Similarly, the use of the submarine technology allowed for an integrated communication space, which was also reduced in crew from 11 to just two. What benefit does this provide to the nation's sea power? Similar crews now routinely deal with complex, dangerous situations 
using the most advanced and integrated data technology. This is both a cost savings to the fleet and an important step forward to solving the challenges of manning the ships and submarines of the future. By capitalizing on this technology, our people can assimilate more information, understand the context, and optimize their response to deliver decisive outcomes. In military terms, increasing the role of humans on the loop rather than in the loop results in enhanced sea power delivered by a combination of people and technology. The F-35, the F-35 program deliberate and successful use of digital technology has a profoundly positive impact on the design, the production, and the operational performance. By utilizing advanced software tools connected across the world with secure networks, we enable people from Australia and the U.S. to achieve continuous design as a single team for a full 24 hours a day. The F-35, entirely designed with three-dimensional CAD software, providing exact representation of each part, which forms the foundation of the digital thread between the product data, the simulation, the tooling, the fabrication, assembly, and mating. This enabled the aerostructure team of GKN in Melbourne to design the weapons bay of the aircraft while remaining completely integrated in the design model in the USA. The benefit, faster development, access to specialists and, talent and technical talent within Australia, secure and accurate control of the design, and rapid prototyping. All of these attributes contribute to designing in real time, further reducing risks in the design and the production line, and saving on rework and cost growth. The attack class submarine. In Adelaide, our sovereign design team with our partners uses that same modeling technique and technology for the design of the attack class submarine. Some examples, by adopting the fourth industrial revolution tools such as model-based system engineering and simulation of the design both in a static and dynamic phase. Our team can concurrently examine the performance from the perspective of the people and the machine. The ability to use virtual reality to have our joint government and industry staffs test concepts and modify the design before the physical systems are even built increases the future sea power efficiencies, speeds the design and the end product to the fleet. The resultant is precision, schedule, and cost control, whilst developing training and support systems simultaneously, benefiting all aspects of efficient program management. The benefit of secure high-speed data global networks enables the following. Concurrent design by specialist teams from around the world. Precision data transfer to manufacturers worldwide. Highly accurate simulation of the whole system for the suppliers without having wait for the submarine to be built. Conducting research simultaneously with production, all while, all while maintaining control across hundreds of human and industrial activities. Technologies and practice, rapid prototyping using 3D printers for both production prototypes and rapid suitability checks, and using virtual reality for enabling crews to train earlier. The support this provides to the Royal Australian Navy, maintaining a potent fleet with smaller numbers of personnel, being able to adapt quickly to the changing world environments, being able to train before the ships and boats are built, all of which supports assuring faster readiness to fight and win. The fourth industrial revolution is unlocking new possibilities and we're integrating these capabilities into our businesses and our suppliers. As the industry has evolved, Lockheed Martin has worked to blaze new trails in the areas of advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, and the virtual reality designs. Technicians are applying augmented reality to speed assembly and test processes and using smart connected tools that let them spend less time manually entering data and more time building cutting edge technology. Engineers collaborate across time zones and, co and continents using virtual reality to create the refined next generation designs and link designs, manufacturing and sustainment teams with them. Software engineers are embracing agile approaches to complex mission critical systems speeding new capabilities from the lab to the user, and enabling new levels of agility and responsiveness to our software systems. We also, we've been pioneers in applying data analytics, machine learning, and model-based engineering to speed our operations and drive efficiency. 
Concluding, the fourth industrial revolution is here. Our challenge is to smartly and effectively apply the technology across all areas to enhance Australia's sea power. The human element remains the most important area to focus on. Future decades will bring enhanced threats, high energy, kinetic weapons that will accelerate the reaction time required to defeat them with solutions based on increased layers of data arriving from assets in space, air, above and below the sea and the land. By developing the ability of our people to take advantage of the tools to refine options, reduce ambigu ambiguity, increase safety and effectiveness, and train will achieve the greatest benefit for the Australian Navy. Australia's industry has already adopted this industrial revolution technology, but it's in the early days for the major programs and the operational force. I would characterize this as a national evolution of people and technology that is important, exciting, and inseparable from the element of Australia's defense. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. North. I'd now like to invite Professor Tanya Munro, our Chief Defence Scientist. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you today. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and acknowledge their connection to the land um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It's a real pleasure today to have a chance to briefly share with you um, some thoughts about the role of science, innovation, technology and industry in sea power, particularly in the context of the fourth industrial revolution we're currently experiencing. Joe talked about providing industry with the tools. What I'm gonna to touch on today really bookends very nicely with that in that what we're about is trying to develop the tools. See if I can get this to work. Wonderful. So critical to addressing the forced industrial resolution is the ability to innovate. The 2016 Defence White Paper revolutionised innovation in defence because for the first time, defence industry and the R&D sector were acknowledged as critical contributors to defence capability. A new defence innovation system was established, which is built on three pillars. The Centre for Defence Industry Capability, or CDIC, the Defence Innovation Hub, or the Hub, and the Next Generation Tech Fund, or NGTF. The Centre for Defence Industry Capability is an overarching coordination body with representatives from industry and defence that drives the strategic leadership overseeing industry programs and providing business and skilling services. The Defence Innovation Hub is a virtual hub that brings together various innovation programs to undertake collaborative activities over the entire life cycle of defence capability. And the Next Generation Technology Fund, which is managed by DST Group, is an investment of 730 million over the next decade to 2026 that supports research in emerging and future technologies, most importantly in collaboration with universities and industry. It really has provided a range of mechanisms that allow us to enhance the way we work with this nation's outstanding research and development sector. Now, this certainly has been a significant step change, but it's not the end state, it's a journey. And really my hypothesis I'm putting you to you today is that it's not enough to see it simply create these mechanisms, but that we need to use some of the big challenges that we face, some of the problems we need to solve, which I'll talk about right at the end, as a way of putting pipe cleaners through that innovation pipeline, making sure all the elements connect together and make sure that we're best positioned to take some of the knowledge created in this country and pull it through to outcomes and to industry growth. Very briefly, many of you will be familiar with the Next Gen Tech Fund, but for those who aren't, um, there are nine priority themes um, within NGTF that represent technology areas that defence has defined as being critical to future capabilities, and all of these nine priorities have relevance for sea power into the future. 
In parallel with this, seven mechanisms have been established to implement the programs. These range from grand challenges and cooperative research centres, which have industry-driven projects, through to small business innovation research grants modelled on the very successful innovation schemes coming from the US, and state-based research networks that give us the chance to change the dynamic of Australia's universities competing for funding to collaborating to deliver bigger programs. To date, we've committed $150 million to more than 130 research activities and had more than 1,000 applications for NGTF. Interestingly, about 30% of those 1,000 applications have come from organisations that have not previously worked with Defence. So it's quite clear that this scheme is starting to shift the dial. This has involved 24 universities, 15 small to medium enterprises, three Defence Primes, and CSIRO, Australia's largest publicly funded research organisation. So briefly, Really, in order to deliver uh, on the benefits of Industry 4.0 for sea power, we need to think about how that science comes together. The Maritime Science and Technology Program contributes to the conduct of maritime operations, sustainment of the current force, and the development and delivery of Navy's, Navy's future forces. We, in Defence Science and Technology, support all aspects of the Attack Class Submarine Program as well as targeted requirements for the Hunter-class frigate, including support to the combat system for the frigates. Scientific support is provided to all other maritime acquisition programs through agreed S&T plans. And these S&T plans range from solving problems faced today right through to longer term science and technology work required to make sure that as we to implement these long-term programs, we're best positioned to make sure that cutting-edge technologies go on to them. In the past 12 months, DST has provided extensive scientific support to the Canberra-class LHD ships, the MK48 torpedo, Poseidon maritime surveillance aircraft and the combat system on the Collins-class submarines. I'd like to give three additional examples of science empowering sea power. This includes scale model testing of the landing helicopter dock craft in different wave conditions and cargo loads to assist Navy in understanding how to operate the landing craft. Options have been investigated for integrating uninhabited aerial systems into a surface ship combat system to explore the impact of different levels of integration between a UAS capability with radar, electronic support and electro-optic sensors as well as the ship's own sensors inside the combat system. And DST is working closely with CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology to develop techniques for better understanding and predicting environmental conditions and thus the performance of sonar systems with a high or low probability of detecting submarines. This knowledge is vital for future undersea warfare operations. Successful innovation in the fourth industrial revolution requires the formation of multi-organisational activities that are truly interdisciplinary. And this is where the problems bring together the teams that make sure that we can handle and deal with the volumes of data and use them to drive better outcomes and decisions. The ANZAC class anti-ship missile defence program is a good example of such a team. CEA Technologies, Saab, BAE and Defence brought their individual expertise and experience and worked cooperatively to deliver that program. For DST, this was a first in that we developed a laboratory representation of the operations room in the upgraded ships, working with the crew of the HMAS Perth to undertake system and human performance studies of the upgraded ship prior to the first ship being upgraded. This is a great example of the ship zero activities that will need to become standard in future. A key technology for the fourth industrial revolution is autonomy. In November last year, DST and the Royal Australian Navy conducted Autonomous Warrior 2018 at Jarvis Bay. This was a multinational exercise aimed at demonstrating how autonomy in command and control can significantly reduce the number of operators required to op operate autonomous systems. 
bringing together platforms from our allied nations and many from Australian industry, we were able to demonstrate taking us from the current paradigm of four humans to operate one platform to having one operator operate more than 10 platforms, a more than 40-fold increase. And this is clearly going to be critical for Australia to manage its maritime environment. Shown on this slide are just some of the autonomous vehicles that were part of this trial. The challenge now for science, technology and industry is to keep pace with the change. For DST, we're concentrating on the payloads and how to get the best out of the sensors and processing to deliver military impact. And some of the other things that are critical are making sure we have sophisticated ways of task allocation, of task handover, and really the human aspect of data fusion and data overload to the human. So I said at the beginning, I think one of the most powerful ways to make sure that we can embrace and get benefit from this fourth industrial revolution is to bring together experts from different fields to tackle big problems, not to tackle these fields in separation. Right now, we're deep in consultation in developing the next defence science and technology strategy for Australia. And at the heart of this strategy is the concept of the star shot. The star shot is really a more ambitious, far-reaching moonshot with the idea of articulating a set of really specific science-powered, technology-powered things we'd like to demonstrate that can't be done with current science and technology and that can't be delivered by us alone in defence but require deep long-term partnerships with industry and universities. This is a set of these star shots that we're currently out consulting about. If you would like to join in this conversation, please go to the DST stand and register for one of the workshops that are coming up at all of the capital cities around Australia. They will have senior defence capability managers as sponsors and give us a chance to work together to make sure we embrace the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I'd now like to call up Mr. Leonard van Bokhoven, the Global Lead for National Security in NATO for IBM. Thank you. Well, a very good morning, and thank you very much for uh, this wonderful panel so far. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to address you here today. I'm going to talk briefly about and say what is the fourth industrial revolution I'm going to do for sea power. And, um, when we look around the world in our global practice, uh, we see defense transformation happening uh, in a geopolitical context, which is obviously different where you live. But where we see commonality is that uh, each of the defense forces, naval forces and so on, are embarking on a digital reinvention. They're trying to address very complex challenges and disruptors and trying to find new ways of working with industry and with partners um, to, enable, uh, to deliver value and to do that at scale. So this digital reinvention is certainly happening around the world, and it was very good to see uh, the launch of the naval strategy here, uh, industrial collaboration strategy here in Australia. So we're talking about a number of technologies that are driving this disruption, and they're um, definitely driving this whole transformation of the um, armed forces. It is common across all industries, and I'm going to share a couple of examples with you here today. So those technologies are disrupting many industries. We talk about, say, technologies like AI, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, pervasive connectivity like satellite communication, but also 5G, the proliferation of software, literally everywhere, and embedded sensors. The combination of, say, that whole area is driving, let's say, changes in three main areas. We see um, an impact on improved operations and lower costs. It's one distinct use series of use cases. Second, we see new products and business models uh, starting up in uh, defense and, uh, and, and also in the commercial sector. But also third, the operator engagement, the way you experience technology and deal with technology, the human machine interface, things like that are heavily impacted by this. Basically what we're looking for is systems that uh, think and act like humans. So things that, uh, systems that understand, cognitive systems understand imagery, language, other unstructured data, just like humans do. Second, these systems reason. They can infer, they can reason, grasp underlying concepts, form hypotheses, and infer and extract ideas. Third, these systems learn 
and effectively. Um, they're interacting and based on the outcome, they develop and sharpen the expertise and they never stop learning. And fourth, they interact with humans in a different way, in a natural way. So IoT technology is used actually to coordinate um, vital infrastructure imports and enable autonomous ship operations. And let me give you an example from my home country, uh, the Port of Rotterdam. The Port of Rotterdam actually, uh, which was uh, started in 1260, the year 1260, by putting a dam in the Rotter. And then there was a harbor created from that point on time. And the rest is history, I would say. Um, the Rotterdam is huge. It's only comparable ports are in China and Singapore. Uh, it's a government-owned entity, and the government is the landlord of the port. The terminal operations, like Maersk, we heard this morning, they're handled by other companies like Maersk. Um, they basically want to go from a, being a physical landlord to being a digital landlord. The real objectives behind that are twofold. They want to decrease the deep sea turnaround time, and second, they want to maintain safety whilst maximizing throughput, and to also do that in an environment, environmentally conscious way. The threats to the Port of Rotterdam are caused by, for example, smaller autonomous vessels because they reduce the need for hub ports like Rotterdam. So they see that on the horizon. Uh, but also they see the rise of non-traditional operators like Amazon. They have got an ocean shipping, shipping license. So uh, between IBM and Cisco, we want a contract for a smart port platform. The very first use case that we worked on was under keel clearance. Um, this is in production right now. And you can imagine that with a 25 meter depth of the harbor, a fully loaded ore vessel will actually run at 24 and a half meters. So there's half a meter. And we have to be hyper precise in our predictions about how much room there is to maneuver because um, any wrong move could actually paralyze the harbor for quite a while. So there's a, a whole series of sensors, hydro and meteor sensors, and uh, like 44 of those. And with 40 radar posts, we integrate all that information, and that actually um, creates a picture of what the harbor is all about. We are creating a what's called digital twin. That's the dot on the horizon to really have a fully developed digital twin, a replica of all the physical assets, processes, and systems. The representation um, has both the dynamics of, let's say, what is going on in the port, but also the static pieces are in there, and actually the management of that through the life cycle of the assets. The second use case that we used there was automated visual inspection of the port's assets. The total area covers 105 square kilometers, and there's about 2,000 kilometers of roads. You can imagine the number of assets that you see there, uh, that they are out there, like traffic signs, street lines, buildings, water fender beams, K walls, staircases, etc. We're using that technology, visual inspection technology, to uh, analyze the, the assets and to see their quality. And actually, the interesting results are stunning in the sense that. Um, uh, the visual inspection models for roadside detection, recognition, and quality inspection, uh, but also on the water side, actually achieve equal or higher and then human accuracy on the inspection. Another use case around that is, the, so to say, a smart peer enabled by, for example, 5G and, uh, and advanced video analytics on the back end that improves port safety and security. So that's happening, I would say, on the commercial side, and there's one example that I wanted to share with you. When we go to the asset itself, the, um, the, uh, the carrier, the um, vessel, we're talking about uh, topics like uh, integrated AI to do predictive and prescriptive maintenance of those assets. Um, basically, we use algorithms and AI to determine the likelihood of asset failure, calculate the time to failure, uh, prove insight, provide insight, uh, in, in what are the top failure modes, and recommend optimal maintenance schedules. And that's, let's say, a uh, shipboard a solution that we can provide. And, and Joe already mentioned a particular example of a vessel, uh, and I'm quoting exactly the same LCS fleet. Um, the issue with the LCS fleet is indeed the manning, um, but also uh, you want to run it with minimal manning, basically, that, uh, that ship. But in the US, one of the issues is that there's two variants of these ships. And there is an agreement between, let's say, the maintenance. The maintenance is conducted, the, the corrective maintenance is done by the contractor, um, but the predictive and preventive maintenance is done on a split between, let's say, government uh, and the maintenance crew and the um, 
um, the contractor. So there's an 80-20 split on that. The objective of the Navy is actually to reduce the cost of external um, contracting uh, for, for maintenance, but it needs a system actually to as, um, analyze that. So with the growing fleet uh, of LCS um, vessels, that is gonna be a, a major driver of cost. And so we're using this model for onboard analytics to um, connect, say, the sensors together to predict its performance, propose rep repair, and actually optimize that. So there's a constant learning loop involved in that, in that whole process. The second example I want to give to, that, give to you on that about this, what we call cognitive equipment advisor. And again, I'm using the word advisor here because it doesn't take over the role of the operator. It actually advises the operator what to do. Uh, was a, a use case uh, with uh, nuclear submarines and the battery life uh, because they were uh, facing some unpredicted battery failures and resulting in early battery replacement. You can imagine what it does to your uh, availability if you've got to replace a battery on a um, nuclear submarine. So basically what we did in that case, we ran data and analytics on these uh, submarine boats, um, collecting, what is it, 21 million point data points, collected to say out of that uh, a model that uh, modeled the uh, failure modes and based on that recommended like when do you need to do maintenance, how can you do preventative maintenance and you, uh, increase your uptime and availability of the, uh, of the submarine. That is all based on models that we've created. Uh, so both on the uh, harbor side and on the ship side. So when we bring these two together, we think uh, it is really important that, and the terminology was used before, that you create, let's say, these digital twins or ports and ships to actually and connect the two through a digital thread. Because we think it's critical to continue shipbuilding, like the objectives that we see here, here in Australia, but also to enable autonomous operations. The application of Internet of Things, advanced analytics, and AI technologies, we think is essential to establishing this digital threat and will be essential, I think, for the future of the naval forces. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Okay, uh, we'll go into our question and answer session now. All right, so first of all, uh, I'll ask a question generally to the panel and uh, then we'll go from there. So should modern militaries be looking into offensive cyber operations as part of military strategy rather than just defending against them? Well, I'll start, start with that. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's absolutely the case and I think we're, we're there. We're starting that. It's got to be, uh, cyber's got to be built in and it's got to be both in a a offensive and a, and a defensive capability. And I'll add to that by saying that it's clear that the nature of threat has changed and the nature of threat is now very much in the cyber domain. And in fact, we had a landmark this year when ASD publicly started to talk about their role in offensive cyber. So it's the nature of warfare changes. We have to change with it. I think it's a moot point at the point on because everybody needs to get, start engaging that. I think they are. So, yeah. I thought it might be. Uh, I thought I might talk about my teenage daughter at this point when we're talking about <laughs> offensive cyber. Um, so she was very upset with me the other day because her Spotify account wasn't downloading as fast as she wanted it to. Uh, and I thought, the poor pet, she knows nothing about the grief of having a cassette <laughs> in the 80s be chewed up by a cassette recorder. And apologies to all those in the audience who have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but look, what it, what it made me realise is that the speed uh, and agility of new technologies that we need to deal with. So I think, you know, whilst, whilst we've seen a number of changes, you know, just in entertainment and just in those sorts of areas over the last couple of decades, like it was really only a decade ago that the first smartphone really hit the streets. And you look at that, that has totally changed our world. Um, and so, you know, we talk about cyber and go, right, well, we've got to get on board with cyber. The issue from my perspective is how fast we're able to react to these sorts of things. So one of the things I might ask the panel is in terms of our agility and our ability to get ahead of these issues, how do you think we might learn from industry or learn from other, other industries, um, you know, how we might get ahead of these issues? 
Uh, I will say that um, the, the other challenge related to getting, we're, we're moving in it today, but the challenge is cyber and, and the effects of cyber are not stagnant. And they change and the threats change constantly, which uh, requires uh, on today's ships constant, a, a position actually, a crew created position that basically is monitoring what's going on there and being able to make sure they've got what they need to continue the fight against it. Um, I think uh, industries, both on the commercial side and the defense side and the science side, really need to, that's where we need to get together because I think it all has to come uh, across the board. We're doing a lot of uh, uh, R&D and we're doing a lot of uh, engineering and, and, and innovative technologies, but I think it would be faster if the three of that could be combined somehow and we kind of put those focuses together. Did you want to say? If I can comment maybe from, because the need for agility is, is very clear on the commercial side, I mean, in the sense that we, we're constantly uh, confronted with other competitors, new entrants and so on, and we have to go through the digital reinvention also of ourselves. I mean, IBM is a 107 years old industry. We had to constantly re reinvent ourselves um, uh, from new entrants uh, or against new entrants and so on. So that agility is very much needed. And the core of that, I think, is are we truly focused on the needs of the client in that case? So in defense terms, are we truly focused on the needs of the operator, directly working with the operator? And one of the ways we do that is through our design and design thinking. That is a method we've been starting to, to start use actually since 2013, because at some point in time we lost a bit of the plot on innovation. And in order to get them back, we said, well, you must focus on the needs of the operator of your client and put them at the heart of your business. And actually, design thinking helps us do that. And I see a big movement around the world now, also for military design, and to put the operator back at the heart of what's needed. And the idea is then that you would actually experiment with the operator and do rapid introductions of new technology. Come with a minimum, in commercial side, we talk about a minimal viable product. Come with a minimal viable product, try it out, improve it, and do that rapidly, and do the interaction rapidly. I think that's something, um, the practices we should do in, in defense and in naval platforms as well. And to build on that, I think um, there's no doubt that the center of gravity of digital innovation is in industry, big and small. And to have that agility, we simply need to partner in solving problems so that we are constantly aware of what's coming through and how we can adopt, embrace, play with and fail so that we have better solutions yeah. to do it together. In, in, um, on the commercial side, we sometimes say fail, of, fail often, fail fast. I don't, it doesn't resonate in military terms very well because failure no, is no it's option. Not option. It's not an option there. And that's not the idea about it. The idea behind it is like come forward with a proposal, a minimal viable product. See if it meets the needs. Don't work for the 100% solution that you get in seven years from now. Come up with a solution that actually you can start lay your hands on right away and start practicing that. But what uh, we can well. do in defence is create those real like um, trial environments Absolutely. where we can yeah. we can have that safety to try Absolutely. emerging technologies, right. and I think yeah. that's got to be more of the way of the future. Yeah. 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 That's what we call garage environments where you do that together with clients. Thank you. So cassettes and typewriters are safer. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. Uh, a question over to Pro Professor Munro. A number of the aspirational star shots appear to be heavily reliant on internet technologies. How can we protect emerging technologies from the risk of cyber attack? Look, that's a very good question. There's no doubt that the majority of the star shots, just like the majority of emerging technology, rely more and more heavily on data and communication and integration. I think this is a very complex question. I'm going to start with culture. And the first aspect of culture is security culture. Helping raise the level of understanding um, of our researchers in our universities, for example, around how to protect and identify new directions of research that might be targeted by those seeking to get a leap ahead. Um, creating environments where we can work on some of the most important problems for defence and national security in new environments that are based around that understanding of what it is we need to protect and why. So some of the thinking we have is around developing collaborative precincts where we can focus on some of these star shots, these big projects together, and in doing that start to raise that understanding of security culture. We'll never be able to be 100% sure that we can entirely protect 
things that are sensitive. Part of reframing and strengthening our position is getting better and better at making sure we think about what it is that is done by public service scientists, what is done in organisations like DST Group, and what can be quite safely grown and accelerated through our academic partners. Of course, industry can work on both sides, um, and increasingly universities are starting to look at how they can have secure facilities in order to work on more sensitive topics. It's not easy, and I guess I see my role and those of my staff is avoiding us getting to the position where we don't do things that could confer national benefit for fear that they might be lost. We need to create that confidence and that environment in which we can reasonably protect. Any other comments from the panel? Yeah, there's one particular aspect I think that's uh, raising a lot of um, um, questions nowadays is the security of the supply chain of technology. Where is the technology coming from? And will you be able to track back, let's say, these new technologies uh, to, to the origin, so to say? And that goes for semiconductors, uh, because we've seen attacks that are built in and baked in on, your, on, on the semiconductors. So there, there's a need for a digital supply chain also on that side, in terms of where is the technology um, uh, coming from, where are your algorithms coming from, and how do you protect them and keep them safe? Um, because they will be spoofed by others, I mean, if, um, if they can lay their hands on it. Thank you. For the panel, uh, how does the panel see the Australian shipbuilding industry competing with that of other shipbuilding countries? So I might uh, start with that one. I think um, the great thing that we can say about the investment that our government has made into our Australian shipbuilding plan, some, some $90 billion in our submarine and ships alone, is that the mere investment will see us develop skills and agility and you know, really be in a position to be able to export by nature of the fact that it's going to be doing things. And if I can, if I can talk to that, if I look at... Uh, uh, it was a good example that Tanya used about the uh, anti-ship missile defence upgrade that uh, we did in Western Australia. Um, a really terrific project that was under a lot of pressure at the start, um, but, it, but what happened there was the, the team worked together across industry, across navy, across defence, across science, and really came out with a fantastic outcome. Um, one of the things that was great about that was the longer that program went, the better industry got at delivering it. And the point that I would make to you about continuous shipbuilding is that the more we do it, uh, with it, the better we will get at it. So that would be the first point I would make uh, in that respect, in that in the, in the case of building and then supporting our ships, we will be better placed to export. And just on the support side, I will say, um, you know, th there are places in the world that, that ships could be built cheaper. There is no doubt about that. But where Australia really has an opportunity is to provide safe, secure, uh, high-end, uh, top-class shipbuilding. Uh, you know, there is a market for that. And that is something that I think we do extremely well and will continue to do well. And I think that ability to export not just shipbuilding, but a support system that underpins that shipbuilding will be vital, and that will be a really key part of success for exports uh, for our Australian shipbuilding program. Uh, but I'd be happy, uh, Joe, if you had any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, and I, I'll, I may cover a few you've already touched on. I think the, uh, the a credit to the to the country and, and defence and the navy. You took a, a basically a I'll call it a swamp for no better word, but. Uh, and turned it into you know quite a capability. And there's three ships. Can ship I quote you on that then, Joe? There's, you can quote me. There's, there's three ships out there in the water today, uh, to, as as proof of what what the capability was and how fast that came. Uh, for you know you have uh, Navace, ASC, BAE, all all very good, very skilled at what they do. Um, so the shipyard part you can you can say is there. Um, the 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 newness of it, I'll call it, as many of the uh, people could be in the audience with uh, countries with very old shipyards, um, is, but you started it in a digital technology. You, you started it in the, in the effort to where you can actually be the most efficient and, and easier to adapt to the changes that are needed to do, both in a, a design to production, a design out to the, to the subcontractors, uh, like I mentioned in, in my, uh, my talk earlier. Um, 
the management has to be there, the skills, I think you've got that. Um, the staffing and the skills to keep that yard going is the challenge, and that's exactly what you just talked about, that you know, the investment now is go gain those skills, and then you gotta maintain the skills, which is back to uh, a continuous production line is the best way to lower your rates, get competitive. Uh, but I do feel that there's, there's enough uh, visual talent and, and product that came out that I think uh, Australia has a very good opportunity to be competitive out in the world market. Thank you. Um, for the next question, Professor Munro and the panel. With improved technology in artificial intelligence and machine learning, would Defence be better served investing in a data lake or data echo system rather than a new ERP? Thanks for that. Look, there's no question that AI and machine learning are increasingly coming into almost every problem we work on. The increased availability of data um, from our sensor systems, the need for data integration means that it's just beyond the capacity of the human operators and we need to rely on such algorithms that come from these, these fields. And, and it's pervasive. But what I'd say is at the moment, I think we need a shift from thinking about AI as solving problems to thinking more about managing data because I think we have vulnerability around data, um, data both in terms of security but in terms of potential for corruption. Making sure we curate that data is essential to get meaning and value and, and truth out of AI. Now, the particular question suggested particular technology solutions, I don't think we're at a point yet of sophistication and maturity where we can leap to a, a new technology solution. I think we first have to go through a process of understanding the direction of travel in terms of where we're going with data and how we want to better manage that data. And increasingly, I think that we're going to need to do more processing on platforms and make sure that the information we propagate is the information needed rather than simply providing swamps of data that is vulnerable to pure curation or corruption. But I'd be interested in the views of the panel. I don't think it's a, quite a matter of either or, um, because ERP systems fulfill a certain role as part of your architecture. They actually provide you a lot of process information and a lot of, let's say, structured data structured data about your as-built, as-maintained situation. So you need that repository of structured data anyway, and you need to feed that. And if you bring that into a data lake later for exploitation, perfect. So ERP, there's, it's not a question of, let's say, do you need an ERP, you need ERP, yes or no. I think ERP is the backbone of, let's say, of how an enterprise works. I mean, because they, they actually help you with the, with the processes and so on. On top of that, of course, and you use that data, like you said, in a data lake, and you can start adding their unstructured data to that. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of structured and unstructured data across which you apply your AI to exploit that. And indeed, the big question is, where is all the data coming from, and uh, where are you gonna, how are we going to use it, and so on. I don't think it's an undervalued asset that you have. And I think you should, as a defense organization or as a naval force, you should own, so to say, your own data uh, as much as you can. Um, uh, to be able to exploit that. So I think it's not an either or question. Mm -hmm. oh, there was one for you there a minute ago. Thank you. Uh, Professor Munro, what role will USVs and UUVs play in amphibious operations or will they be geared more towards ocean monitoring like a number of the autonomous vessels shown during your presentation? I think we're just at the beginning of this journey. I think that we'll increasingly, as we come, become more sophisticated in using uninhabited um, platforms, find that they support all manner of operations. And as we develop some of the tools and, and techniques for integration of those uninhabited platforms with other systems, I, I don't see why we won't be using them across all aspects of the maritime environment. I'd be interested in the views of others. But... Well, uh, again, the uh... Going back to LCS as a good example, the whole intent was to bring the mission packages aboard depending on what, what you were setting the ship to go fight in. Uh, we're using unmanned vehicles to clear minefields. We're, we're using autonomous vehicles uh, to be links in the air. So you may have an uh, unmanned aerial vehicle up there collecting the data, relaying it again through other means of, of autonomous uh, vehicles and getting that back to the ship. So. Uh, it's, it's not coming, it's out there. Uh, the, and I think once you give it to the fleet and back to the, the humans in the loop, uh, 
they will actually be able to, to be the best to give us where, where we need to go in the future and how they're going to use it and what they need in addition to what, what's out there. But it's out there today. It's, it's working. Um, it's good to take ships out of a minefield and put somebody with nobody on it in there. I think that's uh, probably everybody's hope. Uh, it's been pretty successful, and it's, uh, it's still a very uh, rapid area of development going on. Great, right, thank you. Uh, given the, for the panel, given the increasing automation of systems and increasing industry partnerships, has the international law, uh, UNCLOS as an example, remained relevant to the current, uh, the current strategic paradigm? I think, I think uh, you'd be best placed to answer this one, Tish, as our uh, resident Navy lawyer. Uh, I guess the, the answer I'd give to that is I, I don't believe that um, you know, we should be challenging our international rules and our rules-based order based on what we see in terms of automation, but it's really important that we understand how those new systems will impact the way we do our business and make sure that the rules of engagement and the way that we use our systems um, are well understood. And I, I would invite you, Tish, particularly with your background, if you'd like to comment on that. Okay. Um, certainly, they, they, I mean, the laws were uh, relevant. They are still relevant, is, is the big issue. And we do need to be mindful as to how this automated, uh, you know, automated weapon systems will work, um, what sort of artificial intelligence might be, be making certain decisions, those sorts of things. But we still need to maintain compliance with the, those laws. Um, I think it, they will, we will continue to challenge those laws because it is, they were written quite a period of time ago, but we still need to understand how we... The, the um, laws of armed conflict, particularly, um, UNCLOS, perhaps uh, a little bit less so because of the, um, the, you know, the, the maritime zones. Um, I don't think we're particularly challenging those too much at the moment. Um, but I certainly think laws, laws of armed conflict are being challenged. Um, but again, we need to comply with those laws um, as we develop these, uh, these new uh, capabilities. Thanks, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry, Trish. <laughs> Okay, uh, moving on. Mr. Van Bokhoven, if sea trade is the first casualty of conflict, is the move to digital ports like Rotterdam at further risk of exposure to cyber insurgency? I think there is no escape from, from a further digitalization of the, the process. I mean, it, it's happening anyway. I mean, so digital technology is making its way into all systems around the world. And of course, you have to protect yourself against that and, and have backup ways to say, if the digital technology wouldn't be available, what's your plan B? So to say, just in case of an outage and things like that. So, I mean, yes, of course, there's a further risk because if you start introducing new technology into that, you've got to protect that. You have to protect yourself. But there's also technologies becoming available nowadays to actually address these kind of challenges. So, for example, uh, I mean, a good example this morning was the um, representative from Maersk. Uh, we were talking about, say, uh, they had a major cyber attack. Um, and actually, through intelligence, but uh, so cyber intelligence and things like that, they actually were able to rebuild their infrastructure rapidly and become and were totally resilient in, in, under attack even. Um, we see also other developments like blockchain. Blockchains are helping us secure that information uh, and actually secure the flows of information as well uh, as part of the global digital trade system. Um, so there are new technologies that are becoming available in order to address the issues of uh, cyber threats uh, to these digital infrastructures. I guess the issue with that question as well is that uh, we'll always be able to find a hundred ways to say no or why exactly. we might not do something. And I think, you know, it's really, um, you know, upon us to look at, well, how might we say yes? And what are the barriers to saying yes? And, and how do we get across them? Because otherwise, I think we may miss some opportunities to actually really look at some innovative technologies because we're too nervous about, yes, we have to address the risks and what might happen. Uh, but, you know, we really need to make the most of those opportunities. Great. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Malcolm, what do you envision will be the biggest changes that will be required within the Navy workforce to fully realise the benefits that the fourth industrial revolution is enabling? Well, I think that's a great question and certainly uh, aligns with, uh, you know, th the, the priority for the Chief of Navy is the workforce. And I think we're seeing some really exciting things in that space about where the chief wants to take that. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that in order for us to deliver on the continuous shipbuilding promise, we must have the skilled and capable workforce to be able to do that. So that's really 
um, you know, the foundation and the base, and I think that's, that's pretty important for where we start. Mm. In terms of what that workforce might need to look, uh, look like, I guess there's a couple of points that I would make. Obviously, it's going to be um, the, the ability for a workforce to be able to look at uh, the technology, the AI, all the things we're talking about today is going to be really important. I had a great conversation with a fleet commander from uh, the Royal New Zealand Navy yesterday and he was telling me about the way that um, they're testing some of their autonomous systems by effectively you know, giving them to their young people and basically say, go break it and come back and tell us what to do with it. And you know, I think sometimes we probably overmanage our capability requirements and in Navy, I think we need to look at how are we more agile with testing and getting the most out of some of these technologies. So the ability to enable and train and give our, give our next generation of Navy sailors and officers the opportunity to engage with this technology and tell us how to use it is going to be really important. Um, the other point I would make is that I think we need to um, also for the future be looking at workforce stability and looking at some of the areas that perhaps we haven't done a lot of in, in years gone by, uh, areas like uh, expeditionary logistics, uh, battle damage repair. We've really walked away from a lot of those things and you know, from my perspective in an uncertain world, you know, they're some of the skills that perhaps we, we want to reintegrate into our regional maintenance centres and our bases and um, they could also be opportunities for regional stability for our staff. So that's just a couple of ideas I think that might change the workforce. Any other questions, comments by the panel? I mean, just one maybe small comment. Um, workforce changes, it's all about also how do you collaborate with new technology? How do, how do you do that? I mean, as part of a unit, you have, let's say, robots and humans working together. How do you, what are your concepts of operations? How are they going to be impacted? Try practice with that. So robotics and autonomous systems units are, are doing that, and I think that will have a major impact on how you work in your workforce uh, as a Navy. And to generalise on that, I guess, my view is that the more we can get our service men and women actually engaging in some of the trials and development of new technology, the more comfortable I think they will be in embracing and, and using them. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some cases where we actually, we need, as I'm back to the crew and the capability, we need them to be telling us what they, what they want. Need, yeah. um, exactly. we, we put the uh, slickest screens out there with lots of capability and uh, it'll take them about an hour or two to tell us what we need to undo and put it into a different mode because that's how they're going to use it and that's that's the way they need to use it. So, I think it's uh, you know, look, our our uh, our younger generation uh, is growing up with a computer in their pocket, or usually on their ear, I should say. Or, uh, but it's uh, we we've done the same thing that you commented on. Is uh, the other thing was bring bring the, the that that talent those crews in to touch, see, play with everything. And the, and the virtual part I talked about is it's becoming easier and easier to go do that in a model before we even put a piece of steel on the ground and really try to perfect what we're capable of, of delivering as an end product. Great. And uh, certainly that builds on that whole partnership and relationship between industry and, and the defence force to understand how we can actually help to improve those capabilities. And with our workforce, particularly from my current role, um, building that cyber workforce is particularly important, um, but we also need to look at across Navy at what our people are doing and whether or not it's contemporary. So there's a lot of work to be done in this space, but certainly uh, we are modernising and, uh, and developing those skill sets. Um, the next question to the panel, given comments by MINDEF yesterday about the unanticipated pace of change in the strategic environment, what do the panel see as the likelihood that the current revision of strategic thinking and capability will be more accurate in anticipating the future? So I, I might start with that one. Um, and I think I'll, I'll then probably throw to yourself, Joe, to have a talk about it. I think, you know, it, it's really important to understand that we have a current strategy and a current policy and we're obviously working towards that, but it's always going to be important for us to be able to move and meet new threats and, you know, address new issues. I think in terms of, you know, where we currently sit with our shipbuilding programs, um, we have built in headroom in those, in those programs to look at you know, things as they may evolve. In fact, it's important to note that we don't even know the sorts of technologies we might be dealing with in a decade's time. 
The way that we're looking at dealing with that is really through the batch building approach to our shipbuilding, um, which I think gives us that agility that you know each ship and each submarine will actually be different as we move through. And Joe, you might have some thoughts on that that I think might be relevant to the question. Yeah, I, I think we we can't we're chasing the changes in technology. It, it is moving at a rapid pace, and I think you you've actually covered it perfectly. So two models uh, that was again not to harp on LCS, but the, the whole concept of the modularity was don't hold up the ship in production mode to make the changes and do the technology development on the shore, put it in a container, bring it to the ship and be able to use it. Um, concept, you know, we're, we're seeing where things worked and things didn't work in that. Uh, but the other, the other piece is exactly on the submarines today, we have, we have continuous upgrades on the software capability, and that's actually with industry bringing algorithms in, coming up with new ways to, to, to either go after a threat that's changed or a completely new threat, and we can get that into the, into the hands of the, of the crew again by inserting the updates. And I agree with you, the, uh, the first frigate is not gonna look anything like the third or the fifth or, or maybe the last, uh, I think, and that, that's a good thing. It's a matter of getting that done, but doing that smartly so that the technology has to be mature enough and you have to introduce it at the right time because you don't want to disrupt the production line. That will, uh, that, that'll upset the whole uh, possibility of showing what we're capable of getting done. So. Look, I entirely support that, but I'll just add further. Um, yes, Wendy's absolutely right. You know, the, as you said earlier, the defence white paper, you know, 2016 is our context. But we also have ways of making sure that we are really um, adapting to changing circumstance, um, both strategically and technologically. So currently work happening on the force structure planning and also defence planning guidance, guidance is increasingly giving us opportunities to make sure that we are essentially testing the vectors of change and bringing that into our thinking. So I think we're getting better as a nation at sort of seeing how we can bring that change in within the context of the current defence white paper. Great. Do you want to say anything? Uh, predicting is hard, especially about the future. So I think uh, it's a matter of that feedback loop adjust rapidly uh, when necessary and building the resilience actually to deal with uh, these changes that you see coming. So the, the other benefit, if I add one more thing, is uh, with with. Uh, science and with the R&D world, I mean, we're already looking 10, 15, 20 years out. What is that technology? How we get it there? Um, and it also gives you an ability, if you, if you get to something that's actually going to be a solution, how do you shape that to get it back to whatever uh, the hardware or the architecture is that you got to get it into? So it's a way of also packaging it ahead of time to have the least impact to get it out there. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I think that's been a uh, really stimulating panel discussion, and I think we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, Joe, I did want to mention to you, I was in San Diego a few weeks ago, and the LCSs were looking great. So I just wanted to <laughs> let you know that that's all good. Um, Tanya, thank you for your insight today, and particularly what you're doing in the Star Shots program. I think the great thing about that is you're really, you know, setting the bar very high there and, and, and forcing us all to actually look at these things from a far more ambitious viewpoint, which I think is terrific. Um, Leonard, a really interesting and challenging example with the, um, the Port of Rotterdam. I think I always like to hear these different sorts of examples because whilst they're very different to defence, you can then look at how we might uh, enable and use the technology that you're talking about in a terrific example and how we might use that for, uh, for our own joint effects in the Defence Force. So I'd just like to say thank you to um, to the uh, uh, panel today. Thank you to Tish for moderating for us. And thank you very much for the audience for the terrific questions that come through. So if you could thank our panel today, and thanks very much. Thanks very much, thank you. Tish. Thank you.